Good morning and afternoon and good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome to the second APOC and the SIOP issue uh, Joint Virtual Symposium 2022. So my name is uh, Kira Nakagawara, uh, working as a chairman of the Executive Council APOC. The APOC is a critical study group of childhood cancer in Asia and uh, it was officially founded just one year and a half ago, though uh, its actual history is about 10 years. So Asia is very large and uh, occupies about 6% of world population. So therefore, uh, we have almost 250,000 children with cancer in Asia in a year. In addition, so more than 80% patients are living in low and middle income countries uh, with very poor survival rate. To conquer such terrible conditions, uh, APOC started to work very closely with uh, Syopasia, just like uh, two fields of a cart, a Chinese proverb. So today, uh, we have a joint symposium entitled Asian Challenges to Conquer Wilms Tumor that is supported by SIOP and NGO, a uh, Magokoro Organization for Childhood Cancer, MOCC, Mark. Please enjoy. Thank you. So then Dr. Hori, uh, could you give a remark as a president of SIOP Asia? Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Hiroki Hori, the continental president of SIAP Asia. On behalf of members of SIAP Asia, I would like to extend our great appreciation to Dr. Akira Nakagawara and the member of the steering committee of EPOC for organizing second EPOC and SIAP Asia Joint Symposium 2022. I hope this symposium will be an opportunity to learn the advances in pediatric oncology, especially today's topics, William's tumor with our colleague in Asia. I appreciate for the contribution of the expert who will give the lectures and the presentation on clinical experience at today's symposium. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for uh, joining. And then the, the first speaker, will be uh, Professor Dr. Robert Graf. So um, it's very fortunate for us uh, to have uh, Professor Graf uh, to speak for us because um, uh, he is currently uh, um, uh, one of the prime mover for the clinical trial of Wim's tumor. So Professor Graf is the director of the pediatric uh, oncology of the University of Saarland uh, in Germany. And he's also the Dean of the medical faculty there. So he has been uh, uh, the prime mover uh, of the Wimps tumor clinical trial uh, in Germany and also in SIO. So uh, a lot of experience uh, in the uh, clinical trial design. And uh, so there's a lot, a lot of things we can learn from him. So Professor Graf, um, I mean, thank you for, uh, I mean, helping us uh, to share your experience. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the um, kind introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you and to give a talk here about the clinical trials for Wilms tumor today. As you all know, there are two main big clinical study groups in the world. This is on one side, the SIO, on the other side, the COG, the Children's Oncology Group in Northern America. They both have large clinical trials since the beginning of the 1970s. There's one big difference between both study groups. This is the start of treatment. In SIOP, we always start with preoperative chemotherapy. Ways in the Northern American hospitals, treatment will start with primary surgery. On the other hand, both study groups have the same uh, uh, risk factors found during the last decades. The 
difference between SIOB and COG is then that we look in SIOB on uh, the response to preoperative treatment, where is COG is already introducing and working with molecular biology markers for risk stratification. Nevertheless, by this distribution, there's only five to 10% of patients that have a poor event-free survival, despite the fact uh, that we try to get better risk factors nowadays. And as you can see, we have started in 1971 with the first SIOP trial, and then continued up to 2015 with SIOP 2001. And in these trials, we already included 28 countries with 261 centers. And in 2019, the umbrella study did start and it included already 2000 patients around. And you see that with the increasing numbers of patients, the number of countries and centers did increase as well. Why are we using preoperative chemotherapy? And I want to show that in this single patient, you see the left-sided kidney tumor at the time of diagnosis, and you see the same tumor after four weeks of only vincristine and actinomycin D. So what preoperative chemotherapy can do is downstaging of the tumor. And you see that very nicely in this figure. If you go from primary surgery, which was done in SIOP1 and SIOP2 and randomized against uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy, you see that the number of ruptures, tumor ruptures, did get less when you introduce preoperative chemotherapy. And also the stage distribution locally did go better. The number of stage one patients did increase over time. So that after surgery, the intensity of post-operative treatment was lower. And this is one of the reasons why preoperative chemotherapy was given. And you see also in the lung metastasis, at time of diagnosis and after preoperative chemotherapy alone, how in around 50% of patients, lung metastasis can go away just by chemotherapy, showing the responsiveness of the tumor on chemotherapy. And during the first four clinical trials, you see the increase of survival rates overall and event-free survival for Wim's tumor. So it was not only by these studies that the outcome was better, but we also reduced the number of patients that did need radiotherapy. And you see that this is also very important because radiotherapy is one of those treatment elements that may cause late effects. And that shows you that our clinical trials today are not only looking on getting better outcome of patients, but also trying to reduce the side effects, acute toxicities, as well as long-term outcome. But there's a risk of preoperative chemotherapy. We always start without histological proven uh, the tumor. And here in SIOP6 and SIOP9, we could show that there was a risk of 1.5, 1.6% of preoperatively wrongly treated benign tumors. In Germany, we started around now 30 years ago by having reference radio, radiology. And with this reference radiology, these numbers was, is now very low and lower than 1%. Just going into SIOP9, uh, the last uh, trials from SIOP9, 9301 and 2001, what was done there? In SIOP9, there was a question if four weeks of preoperative chemotherapy is sufficient or not. So patients were randomized if they did show a response to preoperative chemotherapy after four weeks for immediate surgery or for four weeks more preoperative chemotherapy. And the question was, can we achieve a better stage distribution locally? And you see here, 
the median tumor volume at the time of diagnosis after four weeks. And in those patients who did respond to preoperative chemotherapy, a further reduction in tumor volume after another four weeks of preoperative chemotherapy. But you see also that a local stage distribution after four and eight weeks of preoperative chemotherapy was the same. There was no change in the stage distribution. From that time on, uh, because there was no better stage distribution, four weeks of preoperative chemotherapy in localized Wilms tumor got the golden standard in treatment of patients with nephroplastoma. In the next mm -hmm. trial, we thought we can reduce treatment in patients after surgery. And we look for stage one patients receiving four weeks of vincristine actinomycin D. And then the randomized question was to give two more courses of vincristine actinomycin D as the standard treatment compared to no further chemotherapy. And there was no difference in disease-free survival and overall survival as was published in Lancet in 2004. From that time on, as 60% around of patients had a stage one after preoperative chemotherapy and surgery, those patients only received four weeks of vincristine actinomycin D before surgery and no further chemotherapy if they are stage uh, one after four weeks of post-operative treatment. So only eight weeks of vincristine actinomycin D for this large cohort of patients with an excellent overall survival of more than 90%. Mm -hmm. Then in SIAP 2001, and this is a very busy slide, it shows you that we have delocalized the metastatic and the bilateral cases, and they receive preoperative treatment. And after surgery, they are stratified according to the local stage, the histology, and also to the tumor volume. The most important question in SIAP 2001 was the question of randomization if doxorubicine anthracyclines are needed in stage two and stage three localized disease if they have um, intermediate histology. And what was shown is that the overall survival is super impossible for those with or without doxorubicine after chemotherapy and surgery. So patients with stage two and three localized disease and intermediate risk histology did not receive any more doxorubicine, meaning that the risk of cardiomyopathy caused by anthracyclines was diminished and they did not get this bad <clears throat> late effect. But you can also see in the uh, event-free survival for intention to protocol as per protocol, there's a difference. This is not statistically significant. To avoid here one relapse that can be salvaged in a, a second attempt, you would need to treat more than 20 patients with anthracyclines uh, and then there was the ethical consideration that this is not justified uh, to treat 20 patients with anthracyclines to spare one single relapse that can be rescued. So the standard after this treatment was to give these patients uh, no anthracyclines anymore. But if you look from another perspective on the results of SIOP 2001, looking into the intensity of treatment those with vincristine actinomycin D only, vincristine plus radiotherapy or anthracyclines, four drug arm in high risk patients and stage four patients. You see here the number of patients and the two year survival, event free survival rate. And most uh, patients are in the low risk group receiving only vincristine and actinomycin. But the number of relapses in this group is the highest one. Nevertheless, they can be rescued. And the number of patients dying is getting much smaller. On the other hand, you see that the um, number of 
patients <laughs> dying is much higher in stage four diseases. Out of the high number of relapses, the question is how much can we reduce the treatment in this patient group? And how much will that help us uh, in, if we intensify the treatment in stage four that we can rescue more patients? By reducing treatment in this low risk group, it may cause more relapses and the outcome for all the patients will be poorer. So the question is, what can we do? And there are different future directions that we need to look for in upcoming clinical trials. We really do need better risk stratification, and I will go on to this in the next few slides. We have to minimize acute toxicity and late effects, but we also have to look into quality control. We need to have reference centers for pathology, radiology, radiotherapy, because that will help us to give better treatment to the patients. There's an IT infrastructure necessary to share the data, and most important is international collaboration. If we go to risk factors to show how we can better stratify, the first risk factor may be tumor volume. And you can see here in tumor volume, according to the local stage, and if you have metastatic disease, the volume is increasing. The higher the stage, the higher the initial volume at the time of diagnosis. But after preoperative chemotherapy, the volume will be the same. So you see a good response of preoperative chemotherapy. And even in stage four, the volume is going down. But these patients in stage four receive not only four weeks if, with two drugs, they receive six weeks with three drugs, including anthracyclines. The reason for that is the question, why is the um, volume a risk factor? And the question here shows you, if you have after preoperative chemotherapy, a tumor volume of more than 500 milliliter or less than 500 milliliter, there's a significant difference in outcome. Uh, and this question is why? And if we look in more detail and looking into the histology of these patients, which might be very difficult in the sire, so the pathologist primarily has to look for anaplasia. If there's diffuse anaplasia, this is already a high risk uh, Wimps tumor. If there's no or focal anaplasia, he looks to the regression percentage. If there's 100% regression, meaning a completely necrotic tumor, which is 5% of all Wilms tumor patients with localized disease and around 10% in patients with metastatic disease because of the more intensified preoperative treatment. Then we call this a complete necrotic tumor, which is a low risk one. If you have between 66 and 99% of uh, regression, then you look into the vital tumor area and have the different types of the intermediate histology, if you look for more than 66% of epithelial type, you have the epithelial type, more than two thirds, you have the stromal type, and also focal anaplasia is being an intermediate risk tumor in the SIOP trials. But if you have less uh, than the 66%, and you have more than 66% in the vital area as a blastemal type, this is a high risk tumor. So percentage of blastema after preoperative chemotherapy is a risk factor as we have shown that the blastemal type has a poorer outcome in uh, SIOP 9301, why we did treat blastemal type in SIOP 2001 more aggressively. You see here that when you compare primary surgery with preoperative chemotherapy, there's a difference here in the blastemal predominant. We have around 34% of patients by after primary surgery with a blastemal predominant tumor. But this is only less than 10% after preoperative chemotherapy. And these 10% have resistant blastemal tumor to preoperative chemotherapy. 
the problem we are facing is the problem of our typing of histology because, and I will show you with these two patients here, if we have less than two thirds of a tumor necrotic, then we have to assign according to the cellular subtype. If there's more than two thirds of viable tumor, uh, and this is plastema, then it's called plastema type and will receive more intensified treatment. Now you have two patients. Both have a tumor volume of the chemotherapy of 200 milliliters. The percentage of necrosis is 60% and 70%. And if you have here 60% of necrosis and 70% of plastema, you call it a plastema subtype. But here in this case, even if you have 90% of plastema, but you have more than two thirds of necrotic area, this is still a regressive type. But the absolute volume of plastema is the same. Nevertheless, both patients receive different treatments according to our protocol today. And the question, is that justified? And in a retrospective analysis, we looked here for patients having more or less than 20 milliliter of plastema, and there's a highly significant difference even in regressive type or in mixed type. And if we go even to stage four patients and look on for a threshold where the number of relapses did increase, we found that 10 milliliter of plastema after preoptive chemotherapy increased the number of relapses. And if you have here the event-free survival, which is highly significant between those patients with less and more than 10 milliliter of plastema. And this is the only risk factor here in this life table. And therefore, in the upcoming umbrella trial, we are checking if the absolute volume of plastema is a better risk factor than the complete volume of the tumor after preoptive chemotherapy. The second point we have to look into is molecular biology. And the question for molecular biology is, can we get new risk factors that will help to close the gap for those patients who are still not surviving today? Or can biomarkers help for better risk stratification to close the event-free survival gap as we had seen in uh, SIOP 2001 by removal of doxorubicin? So the question of Molecular biology is an important one for further stratification of patients in Wilms tumor. One of those uh, molecular findings are 1Q gain. And you can see here in retrospective analysis again that 1Q gain might be a risk factor for better stratification in the future. You see here an event free survival if you have 1Q gain uh, and no 1Q gain, there's a significant difference in the outcome. But this significant difference is not as high in overall survival. And the same results are coming from COG. They also found this difference in event-free survival, but also a significant difference in overall survival. But going into more detail, you see that there is no significant difference in stage two and stage three, only in stage one and in stage four disease. And the question is why? And there's one very important issue that is intratumoral heterogeneity. So if you sample tumor material for molecular analysis, and you would do that in the same tumor at different areas, you will find not in all the areas one Q gain. So it is just by random what area you choose to find one Q gain. If you look here for those who have 1Q gain, you will find it in all of the patients. But if you look here down, you find it only in three patients. And this is a question, what can we do to make that better? And that might be done by liquid biopsies, where we will be able to find those risk factors and molecular markers representing the whole tumor. This is ongoing research, and we hope we will get here better markers for better risk stratification by biology. 
Therefore, biomaterial needs to be collected in all of the patients with Wilms tumor. And there's a, a clear advice how we have to do it, when we have to do it. This is a busy slide and I will not go into detail, but please remember the collection of biomaterial is really important to analyze the tumor. And there are many research projects are going on to find here new risk factors besides 1Q gain. There's another possibility to look into risk factors. This is done by imaging studies. And if you have uh, MRI and you can look for uh, diffusion weighted imaging, you will not find between time of diagnosis and after pre chemotherapy a reduction in tumor size or stable disease or even an increase in tumor size. But you also can look into the ADC value, which is correlated with the cellularity of the tumor. The higher the ADC value, the less cellularity you have, and you can see that there might be a shift of cellularity and the tumor reduction. And if you have here a very strong tumor reduction, you may have the same cellularity, but here also if the tumor will increase, there's cellularity the same. And the question is, can us help this molecule, these imaging markers to better define also the plastemal tumor? in the MRI because plastemal tumor will have a high cellularity, where stromal tumors have a low cellularity. And this will be possible to help us to better define Wilms tumor by imaging studies. Nevertheless, we have to discriminate between epithelial and plastemal type because they both show high cellularity. We have also other possibilities to make outcome better of children by radiotherapy. The way we are doing radiotherapy may also reduce the surrounding tissue to be irradiated. And you may hear more about radiotherapy later on, so I will not go here into detail. But also in surgery, you can do nephron sparing surgery, even in uh, unilateral diseases if there is a good response, and this response might be higher and the possibility of nephron sparing surgery after preoperative chemotherapy. Out of all these markers, we have developed the umbrella protocol, which is an integrated research and guideline for standardized diagnostic and therapy for Wilms tumor and non-Wilms tumor. And the goals of the umbrella protocol are Manifold. We want to increase survival rates. We want to reduce acute and late toxicity, but we also want to provide high quality of a standardized diagnosis, treatment and follow up independent of the tumor type, the socioeconomic status, and the geographic region where the patient is living. So, our attitude is to get more patients around the world to be in included in the umbrella protocol to receive the best possible treatment that is available. Uh, this is also an intention of the COG and the cooperation between COG and also SIOP is really increasing. This is an integrated research protocol. It is not a trial to get results of a better uh, treatment by randomized questions. We want to find new markers for future better stratification of treatment, and there will be standardized guidelines. And the primary aims will be that we have to store serial blood, urine samples, tumor, and germline material to analyze molecular markers. And we look not only for one Q gain, but we look for many other markers. And we want to look the, for the plastemal volume and the molecular characterization of plastema to see if also in prospective collected uh, data, there is a risk factor of more plastemal volume for patients that we can use that as a other stratification marker. There will be a radiology review, pathology review as done always before. And there are secondary aims. You see here, there are more molecular markers we are checking. And we want to characterize all subtypes of Wilms tumor and non-Wilms tumor. We also want to develop uh, 
feasibility of target next generation sequencing for panel. Uh, and there's currently ongoing study between UK and Germany, and we have around 1,000 patients now uh, analyzed by next generation sequencing. You want to look in nephron sparing surgery, in minimal invasive surgery. Uh, we want to perform also epidemiological analysis to see if there are differences in the molecular biology in uh, patients from Asia, Europe, or, the, or, the, or other areas of the world. And we want to validate new tools developed within e-health programs to, prove, to improve clinical decision support. And we have guidelines for all the tumors, for Wim's tumor, non wilms tumors. We have guidelines also for relapses for adult patients with nephroplastoma, but we also have guidelines for imaging, for pathology, uh, and for late effects, etc. So what we do need is the biomaterial diagnosis, but also biomaterial at surgery and in follow-up. And we have one other trial, and this is a real trial, randomized question for stage four patients, where we do randomize the preoperative chemotherapy in the future between AVD, which is the standard preoperative chemotherapy, comparing that with vincristine, carboplatin, and etoposide. The question here again is to avoid doxorubicin and to avoid cardiomyopathy, because those patients with stage four will also, in part of them, receive radiotherapy. They will have the highest risk of cardiomyopathy. And the treatment after surgery is not a question of the randomized question. We want to see if VCE is as effective as AVD so that we can avoid more patients from anthracyclines. And here you see the preoperative treatment with AVT, which is vincristine, actinomycin D, and doxorubicin over six weeks, compared to the preoptive VCE, which is also vincristine, weekly given, compared with the uh, given with carboplatinum and etoposide in this schema. And this is an ongoing trial, and the first patients are entered into this protocol, and we are looking for the results of this trial. To get a better structure of our study group, we have started to um, establish a legal entity. This was founded in June 2021, so it's more than one year old, and we have a, this kind of structure and bodies within the SIOP renal tumor study group. We have the different discipline panels, we have subcommittees, but we have also external relations also here to COG and the Arene studies. We have developed with them together the harmonica uh, collaboration where we will do a lot of combined research. There's a homepage that you can access and you can get access to also the internet where you will find a lot of information about uh, nephroplastoma treated in the sire. And at the end, I want to thank all the funding agencies and also parents and children who were enrolled in all these trials. And I thank you for listening to this talk. Thanks a lot. And if there are questions, don't hesitate to ask. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Professor Graf. Uh, it's a very uh, uh, comprehensive review of uh, all these organized trials. Uh, both, uh, I mean, uh, SIOP and also the COG. So we got the juice of it. And uh, um, I see there are questions there. So um, the questions um, is from uh, Karim. Uh, he asked, how can our patients could be involved in the integrated protocol? What criteria should be fulfilled? So for example, some of the Asian center would like to join the umbrella. This is a good question. And we are always open to get uh, new countries, new centers enrolled in the umbrella protocol. We do know that there's a difference in the possibilities of many countries, how to join that. The most important issue is that we want to apply the same quality of treatment and on diagnostic procedures so that the uh, patients will receive the best treatment that is possible. What is the um, 
a way to join us is to contact us. And then we can, in an individualized approach, tell them what they need to do. So what is needed is an ethical approach. So you need to go to your ethical committee to accept this trial. We do need to know who is the principal investigator in your country, in your center, who will do pathology, who will do radiotherapy, and there will always be help from all the panel members of the different panel groups. So, uh, for example, if there are problems with pathology, Gordon Vujanic, who is the chair of the panel uh, of pathology, will always be helping the people to uh, get the best out of pathology. So the best way would be to contact us in SIOP, and then we will speak to you how you can join Umbrella. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, so the door is always open, right? <laughs> the door is always open, yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm sure the Asian uh, colleagues uh, uh, may join uh, in some way, uh, or even in case we would like to uh, try to design our own uh, protocols, uh, we can also get advice from uh, Professor Graf as well, yes. because it's uh, very interesting to find out the post-treatment uh, breastema volume <laughs> actually uh, yeah. uh, important. That's a very interesting perspective. So because of the shortage of time, uh, we will go to the next speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Graf. If you would like to stay with us, uh, yes. you are more um, Yeah. So uh, uh, Professor Hori uh, will uh, present the next speaker, I think that this will be a record session, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. The next speaker is Dr. Masayuki Haruta, Saitama Cancer Center in Japan. He is a member of Williams Tumor Clinical Trial Group of Japan Childhood Cancer Group, JCCG. And he leads the basic research on Williams Tumor in, in Japan. He cannot attend this symposium and will receive a pre-recorded material from him. The lecture title is Difference in Frequency of Chromosomal and Genetic Abnormalities in Williams Tumor. I will share uh, the uh, PowerPoint slide from him now. I would like to thank the chairman and the organizer for kindly inviting me to speak today. It is a great honor to be able to talk to you today. At the beginning of my talk, I regret to inform you that Dr. Kang passed away in March. I hope to look back on his research history concerning Williams tumor. He went abroad to study chromosomal abnormalities in hematological Malignancy in the Metrolyz Laboratory over 40 years ago. Dr. Kant published many papers on chromosomal abnormalities of hematological malignancy during his, his time studying abroad. He also performed a chromosomal analysis of the tumor. In 1981, he reported an interstitial deletion of 11 p one three occurs in Williams patient without anemia. After returning to Japan, he researched genetic, epigenetic, and chromosomal abnormalities in Williams tumor for about 40 years. Dr. Panko was a founding member of JPEX, established in 1995. He was also a leading molecular biologist focusing on women's tumor in Japan and Asia as a whole. These are the papers on women's tumor in which Dr. Kanko was involved. In addition to his interest in women's tumor, he also contributed to the establishment of knowledge concerning the molecular biology of other pediatric tumors, such as neuroblastoma, hepatoblastoma, and blood cancer. The title of my talk is the characteristics of chromosomal and genetic abnormalities in one's tumor, 
between Japanese and Western patients. It is the subject in which Dr. Kaneko had expressed the most interest and been particularly enthusiastic about. Many people say that he was a kind-hearted and quiet man with a strong view. I expressed my deepest condolence on his passing. Wing steamer is the most common renal malignancy in children. The median age at its diagnosis is approximately 3.5 years old. Wing steamer occurs unilaterally in 90% of cases, but can also occur bilaterally. COD advocates primary surgery followed by appropriate chemotherapy, depending on the risk status of the tumor. SIAP approach involves preoperative chemotherapy without a preceding mandatory histological assessment. In both protocols, approximately 90% of patients survive at least five years. Wing steamer is the most common renal malignancy in children. The median age at its diagnosis is approximately 3.5 years old. Wing steamer occurs unilaterally in 90% of cases, but can also occur bilaterally. COD advocates primary surgery followed by appropriate chemotherapy depending on the risk status of the tumor. SIAP approach involves preoperative chemotherapy without a preceding mandatory histological assessment. In both protocols, approximately 90% of patients survive at least five years. This slide shows some characteristics that differ between Japanese and Western cases of these tumors. Epidemiological studies show that the incidence of this tumor in East Asian children is half of that in Western children. In the USA and UK, the incidence of this tumors in patients of Asian descent is about half to two thirds of that in non-Asians. These findings suggest that environmental factors play little part in the reduced incidence in Asian descent patients compared with Western patients. East Asians develop with tumor at younger ages than patients in other regions. In comparison between Japan and the UK, Japanese patients had a significantly younger median age at the diagnosis than those in the UK. The peak age at the diagnosis is 12 to 18 months old in Japan, whereas UK patients have bimodal peaks spanning 12 to 40 second months old. In our analysis of 100 once product Japanese patient with limit tumor, the incidence of WT1, CTMMB1, or WTX abnormalities were generally comparable between the populations. However, the incidence of IGF2LOI was lower in Japanese patients than that in Westerners. The incidence rate of US tumor in Japanese is half of that Westerners. So the population based rate of illness tumor with IGF2LOI may be much lower in Japanese than in Westerners. In contrast, the population-based incidence of WT1, CTMMB1, and WTX abnormality may be similar between the two populations. In bilateral wings tumor, the incident of WT1 abnormality is more frequent in, Jap in Japanese patients than UK patients. However, 
given that the instance of the stigma among Japanese is half of that in Westerners. The population based rate of bilateral stigma with WT1 abnormality may be similar between the two populations. The incidence of IGF2 LOI in bilateral WT is higher in Western patients than in Japanese patients. Other characteristics also differ between Japanese and Western cases of Williams tumor. Nephrogenic rest are precursor region of Williams tumor. Two distinct categories of nephrogenic rest sometimes occurs in the renal lobe with Williams tumor. PLNR associated, associated with IGF2 LOI seldom occurs in kidney with tumor in Japan. Williams tumor patients with anaplasia histology show significantly worse prognosis than those without anaplasia. Outcome of Japanese patients with anaplasia might be better than those in Western populations. These tables show the five years overall, overall survival rate and relaxed survival rate in Japanese women's tumor patients treated with JBIT2 protocol. JBIT2 protocol regimens were similar to those of MWTS. Patients were stratified to adequate treatments by their pathology and clinical stage. The five-year overall survival rate is approximately 97%. This result is comparable to those of other studies using COG and CIOPUT approaches. However, small number of Williams tumor patients died within five years. Relapse occurred in about 10% of patients. Patients with poor prognosis need to be treated with more intensive therapy. Most children treated for Williams tumor survive into, into adulthood. However, 24% of survivors are affected by severe chronic health conditions, including heart or lung problems, infertilities, and secondary malignancies. Half of women's tumor patients with nephrectomy have reduced kidney function in later years. Considering disease size and later effect in patients, the therapy intensity should be reduced in patients likely to have favorable outcomes. Therefore, reliable biological prognostic markers to distinguish between tumors likely to have favorable and unfavorable outcomes need to be identified. Various studies have identified prognostic factors for Williams tumor. This slide shows the genetic and chromosomal abnormalities associated with the prognosis in Williams tumor patients. Nowadays, COG uses the combined LOH of chromosome 1P and 60Q as a molecular prognostic factor for risk stratification. However, this alteration was found in only 0.5% of Williams tumors and in 9.4% of relapse cases in in the NWTS5 cohort. COG and SIOP studies reported that 1Q gain was better by marker for unfavorable outcomes. COG is now planning protocol studies stratifying patients using 1Q gain as a biomarker. These previous findings encouraged us to investigate whether or not these non-prognostic factors 
predict the prognosis in Japanese patients. We also tried to identify genetic and chromosomal alterations related with favorable or unfavorable outcomes in Japanese patients. This slide shows the frequency of genetic and chromosomal abnormalities in our Japanese study and other reports in Western populations. Mutation in mRNA processing genes in Japanese living streamers were infrequent compared to Westerners. This difference may contribute to the low frequency of IGF2LOI in Japanese Williams tumors. Reports mutation in mRNA processing genes tend to occur in tumor with IGF2LOI. Other genetic and chromosomal alterations occurred at a similar frequency between Japanese and Western cases of Williams tumor. The common LOH of 1P and STQ. 1P gain loss, 1Q gain, and mid-brain gain did not correlate to with unfavorable outcomes in Japanese women's tumor patient. COG and SIOP studies reported similar incidences of these chromosomal alterations. The small number of patients in the Japanese series may have influenced the conflicting results compared with COG and SIOP studies. Conversely, eleven q loss and 16Q loss significantly correlated with unfavorable outcomes. We found that genetic and chromosomal alterations correlated with unfavorable outcomes in women's tumor patients. Patient with loss of the WTX gene or 20Q gain had slightly worse and worse overall survival rates than those without these abnormalities. Four Japanese women streamers showed loss of the ACE1 locus. ACE1 is a women streamer predisposing gene. Patients with loss of HES1 locus in their tumors had worse relapse-free survival rate than those without this abnormality. WTX gene loss 20Q gain and HES1 locus loss may be new prognostic markers in women's tumors. Patient with chromosome 12 gain in tumors and slightly better recurrence freeze and overall survival rate than those without. Relapse and death occurred in only two and one, respectively, of 34 patients with chromosome 12 gain. A multivariate Cox proportional hazard regression analysis confirmed or suggested a relationship between Chromosome 12 gain and a good outcome after adjusting for age and stage. 36 limbs tumors with 1Q gain were divided into groups with and without chromosome 12 gain. The recurrence free and overall survival rate were better in the patient with 1Q gain plus chromosome 12 gain than in those with only 1Q gain. Therefore, the effect of chromosome 12 gain on a favorable outcomes was also observed in illness tumor with 1Q gain. Previous CGH analysis studies reported no chromosomal aberration in some women's tumors. Patients with these tumor were arrived at the last follow-up. In our study, a CGH analysis also revealed no copy number aberrations and no allelic imbalance in 20 of 128 women's tumors. 
We classified these tumor as a silent type. All patients with silent type illness tumor were arrived at the last follow-up. Dr. Kaneko previously reported that chromosome aberration are closely correlated to WT abnormality. And hyperdiploid tumor with chromosome 12 gain were characterized by the absence of WT abnormalities. Therefore, we classified the other tumor by their WT1 abnormality and chromosome 12 status. Patient with chromosome 12 gain showed favorable prognosis. In contrast, patient without chromosome 12 gain showed an unfavorable prognosis. We divided the patient into three groups according to chromosome and WT1 abnormalities. 54 patients with the silent type and chromosome 12 gain were classified as a having a low risk. 10 patients with 11 Q loss, 16 Q loss, or phase 1 loss, and no chromosome 12 gain were classified as a having a high risk. 64 patients with WT1 abnormalities and no 11 Q loss, 60 Q loss, or phase 1 loss, and no chromosome 12 gain were classified as having a, a, an intermediate risk. We propose chromosome, chromosome 12 gain as a new prime marker predicting a favorable outcome. Recently, Dr. Gert reported chromosome 12 gain occurred in 49% of primary tumor in patients with relax. However, chromosome 12 gain occurred in two of 20 primary tumors in Japanese patients with relax. This conflicting result may be due to the different characteristics of Japanese and Western illness tumors. Dr. Gert and Dr. Kressel suggested one Q gain around the alien tumor genesis and clonal evolution associated with relax or metastasis. So they mentioned at least three samples per tumor are needed to confirm one Q gain. This is the last slide. Some characteristic of even tumor differ between Japan and Western. Incident rate, age at onset, stage at diagnosis, frequencies of genetic and epigenetic abnormalities, chromosomal abnormalities correlated with prognosis. To further understand molecular background in Asia Williams tumors, we need to analyze more tumors, many more tumors, and at least three samples taken from different area per tumor, according to intratumor heterogeneity. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. We appreciate for Dr. Haruta's contribution to this symposium. If the attendees have any question, please send it to a Q and a box. I will transfer it to Dr. Haruta and share his response with questionnaires. Is okay, uh, Dr. Uh, Godfrey? Yes, okay. So because of the shortage of time, maybe we can go to the next speaker. And uh, if there's a time at the end, we can answer uh, those questions. Is it okay? Yeah. So uh, uh, can you turn on the video of Professor Sun? Because I can see Professor Sun is already around. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah uh, it's, it's my pleasure in order to introduce uh, Professor Sun, a long-term friend and uh, colleagues. Uh, so Professor Sun uh, graduated from the uh, Sun Yat-sen uh, University, uh, one of the major university in China. Uh, and she's uh, working uh, right now in the affiliate hospital, uh, Sun Yat-sen uh, Cancer Center uh, in Guangzhou. 
Sue has been uh, involved in uh, pediatric cancer care for more than 30 years. So uh, very experienced uh, clinician and she uh, is the uh, principal investigator of a trial on using uh, uh, Wim's stage three uh, Wim's tumor and test whether actually uh, RT is really needed uh, even in case you perform biopsy on patient. This is a, a, a very uh, puzzling questions uh, previously. And then uh, Professor Sun did a group to answer this question. So Professor Sun, uh, can you share a slide? Thank you, uh, Professor uh, uh, Gokchen uh, for introduction. Uh, I am pediatric oncology uh, from China. Uh, I'm happy to have a chance to be here to present our study. Uh, today, my uh, speaker topic is omission of radiotherapy from the treatment of newly diagnosed Chinese children in stage 3A, uh, neuro, uh, uh, 3A favorable histology risk tumor, a prospective multi center randomized study. A uh, total uh, 11 hospital uh, participants in this study. The research uh, consultant uh, is the Professor of Office Chen at Hong Kong Children's Hospital and University of Hong Kong. Uh, nothing to disclose. The SV long risk tumor is a curable disease. It's a long term uh, cure rate uh, greater than 85%. Mm -hmm. A SIOP and COG. Uh, are two large cooperative groups play an important role in the successful treatment of the risk tumor. Uh, but SARP and COG, the protocol different in initial treatment to the local risk tumor. Uh, in SARP, uh, using the initial chemotherapy without the biopsy, uh, biopsy followed by the surgery and adjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Uh, but in COG, the Use the initial if flatly followed by the adjuvant chemotherapy and more radiotherapy. If preoperation biopsy and more chemotherapy is performed, the tumor is automatically upstaged to the stage three, regardless of the bindings of the subsequent the flatly of the, and the histology. So how about in China? Uh, in China, we follow the COG protocol. An uh, initial method for me for the small and medium sized tumor. The perioperation chemotherapy for a large tumor or in or operable tumor. But biopsy is necessary. Uh, biomarkers has been passed in the recent years. Uh, but in clinical practice, we find that uh, some patients with the stage 3 FH risk tumor were killed with the chemotherapy with all the RT. Because uh, uh, in China, in, in some areas of China, the lack of uh, radiotherapy facilities and or pediatric oncology RT specialist in some areas of China. Uh, some patient uh, parents rejection or some doctors decision. Uh, some uh, patients, we found that some patients with stage 2 FH risk tumor who received the two drugs EE4A chemotherapy experienced the uh, so our patient is the do all patients with a stage three uh, FH risk tumor have to receive the local radiotherapy? Uh, is it feasible for some selected patients with the stage three FH risk tumor to avoid the RT? Do some stage two patients with the FH risk tumor need to receive more intensive therapy? Uh, we proposed the idea in 2010. Uh, on the basis of COG stage system, some clinical pathological features were selected as the stage 3A. The invest the impact of the omitting RT on the survival rate of the patient with stage 3A FH risk tumor by a prospective multicenter randomized clinical trial. Uh, this is the de uh, definition of the stage 3A FH WT uh, risk tumor. Uh, stage 3A1 means the patient received perioperation lethal biopsy, MR chemotherapy, uh, post-operative uh, post 
uh, that negative lymph nodes with all the other stage free uh, features. A stage free A2 means the initial nephrotomy tumor local spill during the operation. A stage free A3 uh, initial nephrotomy tumor microscopic residue. A stage free A4 initial nephrotomy tumor invasion in the micro in linear vessels or uh, perinophyll factors. Meeting any one of the above criteria to participate in a clinical trial. We conducted the perspective multi-center randomized clinical trial from April 2011 to December 2020. 11 hospitals took part in this study, an uh, ethical approval of the and info consent pay. This the inclusion criteria, uh, six months to 18 years old, clearly diagnosis patient with stage 3A FHV tumor, info consent obtained, exclusion criteria, including unfavorable histology, recurrence uh, with tumor, other stage, uh, tumor progression after preoperation chemotherapy, or other kidney disease. The pathology uh, we, using the COG classification uh, favorable histology divided into favorable uh, histology and unfavorable histology. The pathological changes after the operation chemotherapy did not affect the post operation therapy of the patient with the FHV tumor. Uh, this is the randomized uh, alignment. Uh, the stage 3A FHV tumor, the patient received the randomized into the modified. DD4A with the radiotherapy or without the radiotherapy. The modified DD4A means uh, including vincristine, betulomycin, and perilopacin to KHP. Uh, radiotherapy was given within the four weeks after surgery for a lighter uh, RT patient, a 10.8 GYF lab. This is the preoperation the, uh, protocol. Uh, free drugs with uh, vincristine, atomizing, and THP uh, for two cycles. Then the patient received delayed and deflectomy. This is the post uh, operation chemotherapy regimen. The modified DD4A uh, for 24 uh, weeks for the initial uh, nephrotomy, the patient. But if a patient received the two cycles of the operation chemotherapy, then the received the modified DD4A for uh, 18. Uh, 18 uh, weeks. Uh, this uh, slides all the base features of the two groups in ITT intention to treatment population. Uh, total uh, 207 patients uh, were randomized. Uh, 104 patients received RT. Uh, 103 patients received uh, low without the RT. Uh, most patients in the stage 3A one, uh, this is the features between the patient in the immediate surgeon and or preoperation chemotherapy in the protocol population. Uh, tum median tumor diameter uh, was 10 centimeters in the patient with the immediate surgeon, and 12 centimeters in the patient received the preoperation chemotherapy. Uh, for the initial treatment, the 16 60 patients received immediate surgery, and seven patients received the biopsy, then surgery. And 129 patients received the preoperation chemotherapy, of which 120, uh, uh, 129 received the preoperation chemotherapy, of which 127 with the biopsy, and um, two patients without the biopsy. Uh, there was a low difference in five-year UFS and OF, OS uh, between the, these two groups. The 196 patients with stage 3A in the population, uh, 136 patients, uh, almost 70% patients in the stage 3A1. Uh, there are a few cases in the stage 3A2 and stage 3A3. Uh, let's see the survival. Uh, at the median follow up, the uh, 16.8 months. Uh, in the intention to treatment population, ITT population, 
there was no difference uh, uh, in five year EFS and OS between the uh, patient with radio therapy and without radio therapy. In the pathological population, uh, there is no difference in the EFS, five year EFS and OS between the two uh, patients with the radiation and without the radiation. Uh, let's see the uh, subtype. Uh, in stages 3A1 to 3, the total patient at 115 3, and 74 patients received the radiotherapy, and 79 patients received uh, with the out radiotherapy. And in the, uh, there was a low difference, five year EFS and OS between the, these two groups. In the stage 3A1, the total patient 136, uh, 64 patients with radiotherapy, uh, 60, uh, 72 patients without the radiotherapy. There was a low difference uh, in five year EFS and OS between the, these two uh, groups. Let's see the uh, events, total five, uh, eight events in the pathological uh, population. Uh, seven cases were really left, and one case was the second cancer. Four cases died of the tumor. Major relapse size was the lungs, uh, uh, lung. the biomarker was detected in four relapse patients. Three patients had the EQ gain. So discussion. Uh, most of these tumors are sensitive to chemotherapy. The perioperation biopsy and the chemotherapy. Uh, post uh, operate, uh, operative lymph nodes negative or without the other stage free uh, features of a patient with the FHV tumor omitting the radiotherapy in post operation therapy do not increase the local leak recurrence rate. And uh, free just chemotherapy added uh, the amphetamine may overcome and neutralize the negative effects of the biopsy and local spillage if it happens. It is suggests the uh, radiotherapy may be omitted in the patient with the stage 3A1 FH means tumor. Um, in the COG uh, study, uh, this study confirmed that the inpatient with the stage 3 FH means tumor treated with the DD4A with the radiotherapy, four-year EFS was uh, 82% with the positive lymph nodes compared to the 94% with the negative lymph nodes. Uh, entirely the group uh, report the uh, stage 3 FHV tumor with positive lymph nodes had the worst outcome than that negative lymph nodes. Four-year DFS 73% was 98%. But in our study, the stage 3A1, A2, and A3, the FHV tumor were also the negative lymph nodes received the modified DD4A with the RT or without RT, five year even for this survival, 95% and 98%. It is suggested that the different uh, therapies should be considered for different subtypes of the stage three FHV scheme. Uh, our study showed that there's no difference in five year even for this survival between the patient with all, with, uh, with, uh, with all the uh, RT uh, for the stage 3A4 FHV tumor. This is the COG stage 2. Uh, in our the survival rate seems to be better than the Chinese children, uh, uh, Chinese, Chinese children cancer uh, group report 78% uh, using the EE4A uh, protocol, but it is similar to the COG report uh, the survival rate. So we think the uh, in our study the stage uh, Stage A, uh, 3A4 FHV tumor may be over treated in our study. The uh, uh, COG, the, uh, this study uh, saw the 75% patient with FHV tumor with relapse had the EQ gain. Uh, COG analyzed the 1,114 uh, 1, patients with the FHV tumor from MWTS5 study. Five year even for this survival rate was 77% for patients with EQ gain and 90% for those with late, late EQ gain 
within the each business stage, EQ gave us associated with the inferior EFS. In our study, the seven relay patient, uh, relay patient uh, by marker was assessed in the four relay patient, the fleet case had the EQ gain. So uh, we think the treatment of the patient with the EQ gain uh, should be intensive. Conclusions, uh, radiotherapy might be omitted from the treatment of the patient with the stage three, stage three FH risk tumor who received the pre-operation biopsy and or chemotherapy, but post the operation, uh, post the operative negative lymph nodes without the other stage three features. A different therapy should be considered for different subtype stage three. Uh, FH risk tumor for further refine, refinement of the treatment according to the histology, perioperation, chemotherapy risk forms, EQK, and other biomarkers. I thank you for all patients and their family. Thank you for participants the hospital and the research assistants. Thank you, CSA University, for sponsoring this study. Thank you, Professor Brett Bothischen, the consultant of this study. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Sun, for uh, uh, sharing with us this uh, important study. Uh, at least uh, we can uh, omit the RT for uh, or preventing over treatment for subgroup of patient. So, Professor Sun, uh, because uh, the time is uh, uh, overrun, so we will try to keep the question at the end if we have time. Is it okay for you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we'll keep the question at the end. Uh, yeah, thank you, Professor a lot. So I will pass the next two speakers' introductions to uh, uh, Professor Puna uh, Kukuri. Yeah, uh, uh, Puna, yeah. So Professor Sun, please keep uh, uh, with us um, uh, later on, yeah. So uh, it gives me a pleasure to in invite uh, uh, Professor uh, Siddharth Lashkar, uh, who is in charge of our pediatric uh, radiation oncology uh, management group, disease management group uh, at Tata Memorial Hospital, as well as he is a director or he is going to start the proton therapy soon uh, uh, at Tata Hospital. So he can perhaps share his views on radiation, uh, newer radiation uh, techniques and uh, role of radiation oncology or radiotherapy in the management of lens tumor in the current scenario. Uh, Professor Lashkar, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Kurkare. Thank you, uh, SIOP Asia, for organizing this and having us uh, here for the meeting. I'm sharing the screen. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. Yes, yes. Thank you. So um, uh, the mandate given to me is uh, to talk about uh, optimizing radiotherapy for Wilms tumor. And a lot has been told about the management of Wilms tumor. So what I will do in the next 15 minutes is to take you through how radiotherapy for Wilms tumor has evolved over the years. And I will also try to share something uh, that we are currently doing to uh, really circumvent the problems that are associated with radiotherapy when used for Wilms tumor in this very young age group. So you've already heard about the NWTS and the PSYOP approach and the broad difference. Uh, everyone is aware that in the NWTS approach, you go ahead with surgery and then that's followed by chemotherapy and adjuvant radiotherapy whenever required based on the uh, pathological findings. Whereas in the PSYOP approach, we have slightly different. We, we use chemotherapy first and uh, with an intent that you could possibly reduce uh, tumor spillage. You could possibly reduce the intensity of treatment and finally have good outcomes. What we also know uh, in the, uh, from the preceding talks is that the outcomes of both these approaches are more or less the same in terms of disease control and, and, uh, and survivals, uh, but uh, each one of them have their own advantages and disadvantages, which I will not dwell upon and go straight 
to how and what has happened to radiotherapy in Wilms tumor. Now, I, I'm starting off with the NWTS studies uh, uh, because uh, NWTS studies started off in 1969 whereas uh, the, the PSYOP studies uh, started a couple of years later in 1971. So I'm not gonna describe all the contents of each study, but just to highlight uh, the aspects where radiotherapy was influenced by the study. Uh, in the NWTS1 that started in 1969, uh, the broad outcome with relation to radiation was that there was little role of radiation in stage one and young children who were treated with chemotherapy. So we were already refining the use of radi radiotherapy in Wilms tumor, especially in the very early and favorable risk groups. What we came to know from the NWTS2 studies is that for six months of chemotherapy was actually adequate and uh, for stage one and uh, radiotherapy was not really necessary. And what we currently follow is based on the findings of the NWTS3 studies, uh, where we found that uh, doxorubicin and radiotherapy were not really necessary for stage two tumors, whereas for stage three disease, we would recommend the use of uh, doxorubicin and uh, radiotherapy uh, either to the flank or whole abdominal radiation. There have been further uh, risk stratification, which I will touch upon later on when I'm talking about whole lung radiation uh, of various prognostic factors that could be used for uh, further stratifying and further refining the use of radiotherapy in Wilms tumors. So that is what we got to know from the, uh, from the American studies. So similar uh, uh, you know, efforts were going on to streamline and optimize the use of radiotherapy in the PSYOP studies. And as you can see in the PSYOP-1 preoperative therapy, it was, it was found that preoperative radiotherapy actually reduces the incidence of intraoperative tumor ruptures. Now uh, we know that intraoperative tumor ruptures can lead to upstaging of disease and which will again increase the need for um, adjuvant therapy in the form of uh, higher chemotherapy and also radiation therapy. So this is one important information that came to us from the PSYOP-1. Also from the PSYOP-2, we got to know that fewer tumor ruptures uh, with preoperative uh, radiotherapy and chemotherapy than, uh, than immediate surgery. So PSYOP-1 and 2, told us and showed us the benefit of preoperative radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Um, PSYOP-5, again, uh, emphasized on the efficacy of uh, chemotherapy, uh, which was as effective as radiotherapy in reducing and preventing the, the tumor ruptures uh, during surgery. So we gradually, gradually reduced uh, the use of radiation therapy based on the information that we had from these studies. The, the remaining studies in PSYOP uh, were mainly related to refining the indications of chemotherapy. And more or less what we follow now are the inf are, are guidelines that are based on the, NW the NWTS and the PSYOP policies and the PSYOP findings. Uh, uh, important thing uh, is regarding uh, the timing of radiotherapy. And there has been a lot of debate and discussion on whether uh, radiotherapy could be delayed for some time post-operatively, or could it, uh, it was it absolutely essential to start radiotherapy at a per, within a particular window period. Now, this was a report from the NWTS-3 and NWTS-4 uh, uh, and, and, and reported by John Kalapurkal. They looked at stage two to stage four uh, uh, favorable histology tumors, and the radiation type was either restricted to the flank or whole abdominal radiation based on the findings of surgery. And the mean delay or the mean time between surgery and radiation therapy was 10.9 days and the range varied between eight to 12 days. So what is important for all of us to look at here is that the window of time that we were looking at was not very wide. It was actually eight to 12 days. 
And when they looked at the relapses at the end of eight years, when you divided the group into patients who had radiation within nine days versus children who had radiation beyond 10 days, there was very little difference between the two groups. Now, if you broadly look at it, it appears that delay between surgery and radiotherapy really doesn't have a detrimental effect. But with that, you need to keep in mind that the upper limit in this study of delay was just 12 days. So maybe if you have delays longer than that, maybe it could have a detrimental effect. But this is what was seen and reported in the study in 2003. So what do we follow uh, in, in, in our hospital, in our institution here? We actually do a mix of both policies uh, in, in patients uh, where uh, we have, we either use uh, the COG policy uh, where we have patients who come to us upfront without any intervention being done. And in other patients where have, we have some kind of intervention being done, uh, we or we are in doubt whether we would get a R0 resection upfront. In those uh, situations in our institution, we use the PSYOP protocol. So we try to use the best of both policies in our institution. And, and in our analysis, we found that almost 65 to 70% of our patients actually go the PSYOP way. Now, so what are the indications of radiation therapy in Wilms tumor based on the current information that we have? So for all favorable histology Wilms tumors with stage one and two, we do avoid radiation therapy. So patients with stage three uh, or stage four with local stage three and uh, three would uh, receive radiation therapy. At our institution, we use the policy uh, followed by the NWTS, where we give 10 gray of uh, radiation for microscopic disease. And if you have uh, gross residual disease more than three centimeter in the tumor bed, we would boost it for 10 gray more, taking to the total dose of 20 gray to the gross disease and 10 gray to the microscopic disease. For unfavorable histology, we had a similar uh, protocols, but we would uh, extend uh, radiotherapy indication to stage one and two also. The dose of radiation and radiation portals would remain the same. So we, we uh, made guidelines for the country. Uh, this is, this is uh, guidelines from the Indian Council of Medical Research, uh, where we have specified the, the indications and the dose of radiation therapy in various stages of a Wilms tumor. Uh, this we did a few years back, and this is being followed uh, across uh, the country in uh, most uh, institutions practicing pediatric oncology. There are a few broad principles that uh, need to be remembered by radiation oncologists, uh, although they could be tweaked uh, to suit, suit uh, their uh, institutional policies. But broadly, one would try to start radiation within the first uh, 10 to 14 days of surgery. The fraction size of radiation is very important uh, to keep it as low as possible because high doses per fraction can lead to uh, long-term side effects, which is an area of concern uh, when we're using radiation in such young children. The radiation doses I mentioned to you that the standard dose that we follow in our institution is 10.8 gray in six fractions at 1.8 gray per fraction. And we would use a boost for gross disease if they are more than three centimeter in maximum transverse dimension. Um, for metastatic disease to the liver uh, and, and uh, for other metastatic sites, uh, we would use similar dose regimes. But the other important thing that one needs to remember is while you're treating these large volumes of tumor bed, primary radiation, we need to keep in mind the organs at risk that are associated uh, in the treatment volume in order to reduce the toxicities. Uh, just to show you what uh, is the standard treatment and the standard volumes that you would treat with radiation when you're treating the flank, as you can see in this uh, uh, radiation planning uh, image from the planning system, we would like to cover the disease right from the top, from the diaphragm, 
which corresponds to the transpyloric plane. The inferior border would normally be extending about 1.5 to 2 centimeters beyond the extent of disease, which normally would be around the transtubercular plane, which is L5 and S1. The medial border is important uh, that you go across the vertebral bodies and uh, in order to uh, deliver a uniform dose to the vertebra so that there is no scoliosis in the future and also to include the paraortic lymph nodes. And the lateral border, as you can see on this, in, on your, the right side of your screen, is to cover the peritoneal reflection. Now, this uh, for the non-radiation oncologist is the target volume for radiation. So I showed this because I wanted you to see what you end up radiating. So there are a lot of normal tissues that also get radiated in the process of treating the tumor bed, which includes the intestines. You have to be very careful about the opposite kidney uh, because most of the times you would have had a, a resection of one kidney and you would have only one residual kidney and it is important to spare the other kidney from damage. It is important to deliver a uniform dose to the vertebra, as you can see here, so that you reduce the chances of scoliosis in the future. If you're treating other structures like breast pads and slightly higher portals, you have to be careful about that too. Now, uh, when you have a, a spill of a disease in the abdomen or if you have peritoneal seedings uh, or a ruptured uh, pretreatment, you need to treat the whole abdomen. It is called whole abdominal radiation therapy. As you can see here, the volume extends from the diaphragm uh, laterally along the peritoneal reflections, and it would go down uh, almost to the obturator foramen to cover all the disease that could be spelled uh, in, the, in the abdomen. But while you're doing that, you can see the femoral heads and the liver. So there are structures that you need to be protected from radiation in order to reduce the long-term toxicities. And in these planning scans, you can see here, we have tried to shield the, the femoral heads and the liver, uh, a part of the liver, not, uh, not blocking radiation to the uh, disease that could be there. These could be done by simple techniques like putting blocks. And more recently, uh, uh, there are modern machines that can be used uh, for shaping the radiation field as you wish in order to restrict the dose to critical structures like you can see in this diagram in this picture, where you can see the liver being spared and the two femoral heads being spared from the dose of radiation. Moving from the abdomen to lung, there was uh, data from the NWTS 3 and 4, where uh, it was shown that patients uh, who uh, had lung metastasis at presentation, uh, who ended up receiving whole lung radiation, had better event-free survival and overall survival compared to patients who did not receive whole lung radiation uh, after having uh, met metastasis in the lungs. Similar findings were seen from the UK CCHSG study also. And, and in overall, about 20% improvement was seen in the event-free survival with the addition of whole lung radiation therapy and about 12% improvement in the uh, overall survival. And this is again an example of how whole lung radiation would be delivered uh, to, the, to the lungs. And while doing that, we would ensure that you spare normal structures like the humeral heads in this case. And this is what the radiation dose distribution would normally look like. But there has always been this concern about the toxicities of radiation in these young children who receive uh, uh, chemotherapy and radiation therapy and who have a long life ahead of them. And uh, as you can see from these two examples uh, of uh, long-term toxicities of whole lung radiation, it was seen that almost 5% of patients uh, in one of the studies, and in the other study, it was 20% of patients at 25 years who developed cardiac complications as a result of, uh, as a cumulative effect, really, of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So the message is that is although radiation therapy did improve event-free survival and overall survival, there's a significant concern regarding the toxicities, long-term toxicities. And thus, we had studies that, that, that looked at how, if 
radiation therapy could be avoided in a group of patients who had good response after six weeks of chemotherapy. And this is one of the studies uh, from the COG where stage four patients with isolated lung metastasis with favorable histology received the DD4A regime for six weeks. And uh, the response assessment uh, was done to, uh, and, and patients who had complete response would be randomized to either uh, no pulmonary artery or pulmonary artery. But this, uh, uh, there had to be no LOH at 1P16Q. So this was one thing that, uh, you know, a prognostic factor that could be incorporated into the treatment uh, policy decision-making tree uh, to decide regarding radiation versus no radiation. So let us see what happened in this, uh, in this study. So, so the four-year event-free survival uh, was 79.5% for patients uh, uh, who did not have lung radiation, and the overall survival was 96%. But there was an important finding of all the relapses that happened. 92% of the relapses actually happened in the lungs. 22 out of all the patients were uh, relapses in the lungs. So Although we could avoid radiation therapy and have good survivals with a good chemotherapy regime, but the, we, were, we would compromise a little bit in terms of uh, the relapses in the lung. So the similar file, uh, if when you looked at the outcomes when you used radiation therapy, uh, the, the, the event-free survival was 88% and 95% overall survival, but the lung relapses came down from 90, 90% of the relapses to 64. So there was a significant reduction in the relapses in, in the lung uh, after uh, whole lung radiation. So this was uh, this study uh, sent the message that you could get great local controls omitting radiation therapy in patients who have complete response uh, uh, after six, cycle, uh, six weeks of chemo, but it would be associated with uh, slightly higher lung relapses. And of course, there were greater toxicities in the DD4 regime compared to the ones used in NWTS. So that, so that, so thus there was a need to explore ways by which the radiotherapy toxicities could be reduced. And uh, again, uh, from the children's oncology group, John Kalapurkal uh, floated this idea of uh, whole lung radiation, cardiac sparing whole lung radiation. He, he published the results in 2018, and they were quite interesting. They used uh, modern intensity modulated radiation therapy to restrict the dose to the lung uh, and uh, reduce the dose to the heart as far as possible. And uh, so, uh, so he was successful in uh, reducing the cardiac dose to a great extent. So in TMH, although we are still continuing to use uh, radiation therapy for all patients who have pulmonary metastasis because of various reasons, but we are looking at ways to reduce uh, cardiac toxicity in the long run, which is the major concern when you're using radiation therapy. So we are currently uh, have this ongoing study where we contour and uh, mark out a target volume, which is the lung, but we also mark out the heart, the substructure of the heart, the thyroid, the breast buds, liver, ribcage, spleen, kidneys, and stomach in order to reduce the dose to these structures and in the long run, possibly reduce the late effects of radiation that we have seen in the studies that have been published till now. But this is just an example to show you the benefit I would. Uh, ask you to look at V95, that means the volume receiving 95% of the dose. That's the meaning of V95. And you compare the columns of IMRT versus APPA, you can see the great difference of dose that is delivered to the heart. In the, the dose to heart in the APPA, V95 is 100, whereas in IMRT arm, it is 4.4. And if you can look at all the substructures, L, the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the coronary arteries, the vertebra, there is a significant reduction in the normal tissue that is radiated by use of these techniques. So we feel that uh, this will be uh, of great use in reducing the side effects of radiation therapy that we have seen in these long-term survivors. 
Like uh, Dr. Kurkure mentioned, we are keenly looking forward to commissioning our proton therapy center. And uh, as this uh, data shows, there is a shift in the way we treat flank and whole abdomen. The target volumes are changing and we are reducing the normal tissues that we would radiate uh, in the uh, that we would have radiated in the standard NWTS and the PSYOP studies. And currently, we would possibly go and treat a smaller volume as seen in this middle panel, panel which shows the smaller volume of uh, tumor bed that we treat using techniques like IMRT and also proton beam therapy. And these things would possibly reduce the complications of radiation in the long run. Uh, this is just a snapshot of our ongoing work uh, that we were looking at an audit of what happened to our patients whom, whom we treated with very standard, not very high-end treatment techniques. And this was a cohort of 85 patients uh, treated till 2015. We are currently updating our data, so I have not shared everything. But uh, the important thing is that the local controls with these techniques and the regime that we use here in TMH was 90.9%. Now, most of our patients were treated uh, with, uh, with uh, as I mentioned right in the beginning, we seem to be following more the PSYOP policy rather than the NWTS in terms of uh, the treatment sequencing. 68% of our patients were treated with chemo, surgery followed by radiation therapy. The major, uh, uh, the portal uh, was 57% of them were restricted a portal to the flank and uh, there were very few who had uh, uh, whole abdominal radiation therapy. The dose, majority of our patients had 74, uh, uh, had 10.8 gray, as I mentioned to you. And, and, uh, and most of our patients really actually had treatment delays more than 21 days, and that is because of logistic reasons. I wanted to specifically uh, show that because, you know, uh, although we believe that we should be starting radiation as early as possible, uh, we had great local controls, uh, even uh, despite having delays of more than 21 days in most of our patients. Um, just to show us, uh, you know, the outcomes, a few of our outcomes in terms of toxicities, we did not have significant toxicities seen in our patient group. Uh, no second malignancies, no pneumonitis, no scoliosis. Two of our patients had uh, intestinal obstruction uh, uh, post uh, radiotherapy, and that's because of the fibrosis. Most of our patients had grade one or two toxicities, and they were not very severe. The patients who were treated with the regime of chemo surgery and radiotherapy seemed to have better local control, event-free survival, and overall survival as seen in the study. This is not a randomized study, but it seems like in our scenario, uh, we have better outcomes in stage three disease, where we have used radiation therapy by doing a sequencing of chemo surgery and radiotherapy rather than surgery followed by chemo and radiotherapy. So this is what uh, we our experience is. We are moving to conformal cardiac sparing, whole lung radiation, and conformal uh, tumor bed radiation with conformal techniques in order to reduce the toxicities of radiation therapy. To summarize, uh, uh, I can say that indications of radiotherapy for Wilkes tumor has evolved over the years. It is a very effective modality, but we have been trying to uh, streamline and restrict the use of radiation to prevent toxicities. Currently, one would use radiotherapy for uh, stage three Wilms tumor. Whole lung radiation therapy still uh, holds uh, for patients with pulmonary metastasis in most institutions, and it's especially applicable to uh, so the developing countries because you would not have a second chance in these countries. So it's best to have the best outcomes in the first treatment itself. Um, we know radiotherapy is associated with long-term side effects, so we need to be careful about it. And optimal utilization and sequencing of radiotherapy is extremely important for improving outcomes. And we need to use conformal techniques and newer technologies in order to reduce the toxicities of long-term uh, long-term toxicities of radiation while maintaining the disease control. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. And uh, if there's time, I'll be happy to take questions.
Thank you. Yeah, so unfortunately, <laughs> uh, uh, we are overrun uh, uh, quite a lot. So probably we don't have time for question. And also uh, we are overrunning into the AGM uh, schedule. So very sorry for uh, uh, Professor Sajid. Um, we may not have time, but I don't know whether Professor Sajid can share his slide with us and uh, uh, so uh, we can learn from him. Uh, I will pass the... Uh, uh, I mean, our uh, uh, subsequent activity to uh, uh, Professor Hori. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. It's a time to start uh, AGM of South Asia. So please let me move on to the 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 closing. So we 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 are, we are very happy if we can share the PowerPoint slide from the of the Sajid after this meeting. Okay, today the new site president, Dr. Gulemo Chantala, is attending this, uh, this meeting. We would like to ask him to give the comment. Gulemo, may I ask you to talk? Yes, absolutely, Hiroki. It's a big pleasure for me to uh, be sharing with you this first, this wonderful symposium of, of Wim's tumor, where I myself learned a lot and, and, and learned a lot of things that uh, we are the ones that uh, are going to provide the evidence, right? I think you are in the position of having a strong leadership, a lot of patients, interesting data. And we are now facing a very important time in pediatric oncology. We are working now with WHO in order, in order to uh, generate better outcomes all over the world. And we need evidence for that. We need evidence that will come surely from Syopasia in most of the times. Recently, we heard about genomic differences, about different implementation factors, depending on the availability of radiation, results of radiation-free regimens for Wim's tumor. These are critically important. We need we need you guys. We need what you are going, what, what you are already producing, because the world is going to be treated, the children of the world were, are going to be treated according to your findings. So it is a huge pleasure, a pleasure for me and an honor for me today, uh, sharing this time with you, learning uh, from you, learning how you do things. And, uh, and that's all I can say. I, I, I think I, I'm very enthusiastic on all Syop Asia could contribute to the world. And here I am, here I am to help, here I am to provide support, here I am to try to, um, to make your results more, more visible and more impactful in uh, all over the world. So once again, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this uh, general assembly of your great, great, great group and looking forward to be very close to you uh, during my presidency as I, uh, president. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Grandma. Okay, the Bharat, can you ask you the closing remark? So I, I, would, uh, I would just like to say that uh, we had a very good uh, uh, webinar uh, combined with Sayop Asia and APOC, and I think we should have many more such uh, sessions on all the uh, different topics that uh, bother our uh, continent. Wilms tumor is a very important topic and uh, with very good survival rates, more than 95%. But that uh, is obviously not uh, translated in the Asian continent. And therefore, topics that we discussed today are very relevant and important on how to make the modifications about uh, the protocols about the risk factors. We had uh, Professor uh, Graf talking about the approach that they have used in uh, Europe. And uh, there are many points to learn from there about the use of uh, preoperative chemotherapy. And many of these uh, are already being applied uh, in many situations where uh, in uh, Asia, uh, this kind of a hybrid, uh, I call it a hybrid approach where uh, some patients uh, who are surgically feasible are uh, getting operated uh, upfront, like the COG approach, 
and uh, some who are uh, uh, unable to operate up front receive pre operative chemotherapy so i think the both uh, the approaches are being uh, used optimally in the asian situation and i think that's uh, the way forward the way forward is also uh, to incorporate uh, the molecular markers and see how uh, there are differences uh, in the uh, uh, types of wilms tumor that we see in the asian continent this was very uh, well uh, highlighted by the uh, japanese experience where uh, the molecular biology uh, plays such an important role in determining the uh, prognosis and the also the treatment so i think there is a lot to learn and to adapt for our local situations and i think i would uh, uh, encourage each one of us from uh, various countries to get together and uh, brainstorm and uh, see how best we can treat our children i think that's uh, my message thank you thank you, thank so you very much, much.